The following program has been brought to you in part by Sennheiser and the Airline Pilots Association. On this episode, we'll tell you how the new pilot fatigue rule will change the way you fly, what Airbus officials found lurking in the wings, and a Flight Deck exclusive, an interview with the only Tuskegee Airmen who flew commercially. All of this and more here on The Flight Deck. Hello, I'm Sharon Varab. Welcome to The Flight Deck. On December 21, 2011, the Federal Aviation Administration released the new pilot fatigue rule. While the new science-based rule does improve the minimum rest requirements for some pilots, ALPA could not be more disappointed that it denies cargo pilots these long overdue changes. I sat down with ALPA President Captain Lee Moak for the details on how this rule will change the industry. Captain Moak, can you give us a brief overview of how long and hard ALPA has fought to update the current regulations? Our members have worked under uh, the current regulations literally for decades. In fact, the only changes that have ever occurred was a, a change related to an interpretation after we had a problem. How are the new regulations different? The new regulations are primarily different in three ways. First, they're science-based. And this is science that was conducted by experts in the field of fatigue. Second, through operational experience. And third, most importantly, through FRMS, we now have the ability to change these uh, rules in the future. So what remains to be done? In general, we are pleased with the rule, except for one thing, one major thing, and that is that cargo airlines were carved out. It's incredible that the executive branch of the U.S. government made a decision under heavy lobbying from cargo airlines and overnight express airlines to carve out cargo pilots. It's a no-brainer. A pilot, when he's flying, whether he's flying cargo or he's flying passengers, gets fatigued at the same rate. And the whole notion, the whole idea that you would treat them separate uh, goes against everything we stand for. And we will not stop until all pilots are covered under this rule. Later, the chairman of ALPA's Flight Time Duty Time Committee, Captain Don Wyckoff, joined me for a more in-depth look at how the rule will change the way pilots fly their schedules. Captain Wyckoff, when do the new regulations go into effect? Yes, the new regulation will need to be implemented two years after the regulation was posted on the Federal Register. So roughly, it needs to be uh, implemented by January 4th, 2014. And is there a specific timeline? The new regulation and the preamble to it uh, didn't give a lot of specifics about it implementation per se. So we know as a flight and duty time committee that we need to have a conversation with the FAA on how each carrier and their respective MEC will implement the new rule. So what are the major improvements? Well, there's several and the primary um, win for pilots, if you will, is the fact that there's no longer just a break in duty, but the break in duty that we have today could be as low as eight hours. Now it's a minimum of 10, it's not reducible. And on top of that, inside of that break in duty is a, a guarantee for an eight hour rest opportunity which really means that if a pilot gets to his rest facility and sees he's not gonna have eight hours, he needs to report that to his company and the rest extended so that he does have the sleep opportunity. The second one is, is that we no longer will, for domestic pilots in particular, have a standard or a flat maximum duty day of 16 hours via interpretation, but rather the duty day will be based on when they come to work, ranging from nine to 14 hours. The last piece that's uh, really beneficial is that we now have a definition of what an adequate rest facility on board an aircraft is so that the duty day will be based not on a particular hour of flying but what's the quality of the rest facility or sleep facility on the aircraft and then how far that duty day could be extended so now we have a regulation for all augmented flying and regardless of the amount of flying time itself. Uh, probably the last piece uh, that's very beneficial as we move forward is um, provisions to move into fatigue risk management systems. And this is good because it'll help us to analyze what the rules are doing, whether they're working correctly, or in the future, 
If there's something that needs to be answered in a different way, we have a mechanism to do that properly. For more information, including ALPA's study guide on how to apply the new rule to your schedule, visit alpaorg slash fighting fatigue. In an effort to boost tourism, President Obama established an expedited but secure visa process for low-risk travelers. The announcement comes on the heels of ALPA and its industry partners' encouragement to streamline the visa process, especially for travelers from China, Brazil, and India. Captain Moog said in a press release that this is a clear illustration of how our union can help affect change. U.S. House and Senate leaders reached a bipartisan deal to move the FAA reauthorization bill forward. The compromise involves National Mediation Board procedures. This necessary compromise will allow the critical safety legislation to gain much-needed momentum after being stalled for more than four years. The bill is approaching its 23rd extension on January 31st. ALPA anticipates another extension for a few more weeks as the legislators go to conference to finalize the last few aviation safety issues. The Wall Street Journal reports that Airbus found new cracks on metal brackets inside the wings of A380 Super Jumbo jets. It's another inspection discovery from the 2010 Qantas incident where the A380 suffered a mid-air engine blowout after takeoff. Airbus officials insist the fissures do not affect the plane's safety. This marks the second time in recent months that industry and government officials have focused on cracks inside A380 wings. In a letter to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, European Union leaders say that they are willing to negotiate an exemption to the emissions trading scheme so long as the U.S. commits to reduce its airline emissions in some other way. The United States has informed the EU that emissions reductions measures should be established through the ICAO process. Do you feel trapped in airplanes that are packed to capacity? After the break, we'll tell you why it's important to get out of your seat. From the first time I boarded a commercial plane as its pilot, I've embraced the responsibility I have to the safety of my passengers and crew. And I have the best flight gear, even the headset, certified for commercial duty. It lets me concentrate on the task at hand, making this the safest flight my passengers will ever have. The feature-packed HMEC 26 provides long wearing comfort and more than 18 dB of noise reduction. Try the HMEC 26 on your next flight and hear the difference for yourself. Hi, I'm Joseph from Gaithersburg, Maryland. I'm going to ask a pilot how do planes fly. Joseph, that's a great question. And the best way I can describe it to you is if you think about the time when you're in your parents' car, and you're riding down the road, and you put your hand out of the window, and basically you allow your hand to ride in the wind, kind of like surfing in the wind. Well, the principle that lifts your hand up is an aerodynamic principle called lift. And essentially the same thing happens on aircraft wings. As we apply power to our jet engines, it produces thrust. And that thrust moves the aircraft forward. And as soon as the aircraft moves forward, wind goes over the wings. And because of the difference in the pressure between the top portion and the bottom portion of the wing, it creates that aerodynamic lift and we're able to go flying. If you travel often, you should learn all you can about the threat of deep vein thrombosis or DVT. It's the formation of a blood clot that could be fatal. In fact, DVT-related blood clots kill more Americans than AIDS and breast cancer combined. Here's ALPA's doctor on call, Quay Snyder, with preventative measures you can take on these long flights. Get up and stretch your legs. Sitting motionless in the cockpit for long periods of time can cause a potentially serious condition called deep venous thrombosis. DVT occurs when a blood clot develops in one of the deep veins in the body typically in the legs or the pelvic region. If left untreated, DBT increases the risk of a potentially life-threatening condition called a pulmonary embolus, which is a blood clot in the lungs that may come from the legs and travel through the veins, past the heart, to lodge in the lungs. To reduce your risk of DBT on flights, it's important to maintain good blood circulation. Periodically, stretch your legs out as straight as possible. Point your toes down toward the floor and then upwards. Rotate your ankles, moving your feet around in circles. Do these exercises hourly and try to stay well hydrated. The use of compression stockings can decrease your risk of blood clots during long flights. It's also important to know the symptoms of DVT. They include swelling or redness of the legs, often accompanied by some tenderness. Chest pain and shortness of breath can be signs that a blood clot has traveled to the lung. 
If you experience any of these symptoms, tell your fellow crew members as soon as possible. Oxygen will be helpful. Remember, walk, flex, stretch. Stay healthy and fly safely. Each year, uniformed pilots and flight attendants visit hospitals with carts full of toys. As part of an organization called Pilots for Kids, they spend time with sick children to spread holiday cheer and brighten their days. Julie Callens, a United Pilot and Pilots for Kids coordinator, organized visits to three D.C. area hospitals. Right now in my living room I have about $4,000 worth of toys scattered about. Uh, I would like to say a special thank you to the makers of Pillow Pets this year because they generously found out about our, don our uh, organization and they donated over $200,000 worth of Pillow Pets to Pilots for Kids this year um, and we've got them nationwide. With toys in tow, Callens and crew travel from room to room helping the hospital's younger patients forget their challenges for an afternoon. And uh, to come here and give them these presents this time of year and to see the joy in their face when they receive them is just the most rewarding part of this whole volunteer program. Loyal volunteers like Captain Howard Marcus make time in their schedules year after year for these special events. For more information on how you can get involved in Pilots for Kids programs in your area, visit pilotsforkids.org. Oh, thank you. Now it's time to watch and win in the new year. First, congratulations, Jack Burnett, for making it to the next round. Jack will now be entered into the grand prize drawing along with five other winners for a chance to win a Sennheiser headset valued at $850. On to today's question. What are the three ways that the new pilot fatigue rule differs from the old rule? Visit our website to submit the answer for your chance to win. I welcome you to the 332nd fighter group. You're fighter pilots. The expectations placed upon you men are high. We have a right to fight for our country, the same as every other American. Right like that. Boom! <laughs> you might have seen George Lucas's newest movie, Red Tails, in theaters now. But I can tell you that Alpha has the exclusive with the only Tuskegee Airman who flew commercially. His name is Colonel Robert Ashby, and in a special series called A Pilot's Log, the Airline Pilots Association has captured his amazing Tuskegee Airman stories. Colonel Ashby is a former Frontier Airlines pilot who retired in 1986 as a captain of a Boeing 737. In his interview, he tells us about his missions in the military. Right, the uh, 47 bomb wing was the only uh bomber outfit carrying uh, nuclear bombs and we uh, had targets all over Russia and of course uh, with the limited range and uh, non-refueling uh, we were more or less like Harikari uh, the Japanese had because uh, we could go fly into our target but we didn't have enough uh, fuel to get back we would drop the bombs and uh, have about five minutes to try and find some place to bail out and uh, dig in for the uh, five days. They said the radiation would be at a, level, a lesser, lesser level. And uh, so we uh, had these uh, things and we, we, hey, that was our mission. If anything happened, we go in and uh, bomb them and bail out and see what happens. If you know an airline pilot who's between 80 and 100 years old that has similarly amazing stories, let us know. Send us the pilot's name, former airline, and contact information at flightdeck at alpha.org. For the rest of the Colonel's story, stay tuned to our website where you can watch the full episode of A Pilot's Log in the coming months. That wraps up this episode of The Flight Deck. Thank you for watching. If you have any feedback, please let us know at flightdeck at alpha.org. Thanks again, and I'll see you next month here on The Flight Deck. Mm -hmm.